Welcome, everyone. This is Doug Reeves broadcasting from Albuquerque, New Mexico today, and I'm joined by Kim Marshall from Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, we're delighted to be able to talk today about positive classroom discipline. Uh, Kim is a veteran um, educator in so many respects, not only years as a principal, a central office administrator, and most recently a coach. He is a prolific author, and uh, his work on evaluating teacher performance, and you'll find a number of resources in there, um, is just rethinking teacher evaluation and supervision, published by Jossie Bass. Make sure you get the second edition. In addition, you'll see articles on that and many other subjects available on creativeleadership.net and more about Kim's bio uh, there. We also make videos available and previous broadcasts of these webinars, all available as free downloads at creativeleadership.net. So Kim, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you, great to be here. So uh, take it away with the... Uh, okay, <clears throat> so greetings everybody. I'm in, actually in Boston on a cloudy... Positive day. classroom. Go ahead. Uh, so, so greetings everyone. I'm in Boston on a cloudy, muggy day in Boston, and I want to give you a very quick overview of positive classroom discipline, the Fred Jones approach to discipline, which I came across in my later years as a principal in Boston and found it to be one of the most compelling and thoughtful uh, sort of pulling together of research and insights about, about, about classroom discipline. So let me plunge in. Again, this is a very short version. I'll refer you to Fred Jones's book and training, which gives you a much more extensive thing. Uh, but this is just a quick overview in about 45 minutes. Please jump in at any point if you have questions or comments, uh, and I will respond to those uh, through Doug. So I just got a couple of cartoons to start off here. Here's uh, one traditional approach to, to discipline. And here's a sort of a bad moment for a couple of school administrators. I think I'll take the day off. Uh, so the hard truth about things is that students, uh, even students who appear to be pretty nice and well-behaved, really don't have any patience for teachers who don't handle their classrooms well, who don't, uh, who allow the, the bullies and, and the power players to take over a classroom. And unfortunately, a lot of students have quite a lot of experience with this uh, through their years as students. And, and uh, I remember some, some very nice students when I was a first year sixth grade teacher in Boston in 1969, they're rolling their eyes heavenward as I struggled with what they had probably seen, a scene that they had seen many times before, perhaps sometimes with some of the, the same bad actors. So here's Fred Jones, who's now retired. But let me quickly tell you the story of how he got into this. He's a psychologist, so he's not really somebody who was trained as an educator. And at one point, uh, a friend of his, who was the principal of a tough school in Los Angeles, invited him to come in and observe what was going on and give him some advice. So Fred uh, you know, shows up and he observed a couple of classes in the morning and saw teachers who were highly stressed <clears throat> and highly upset at the kids. The kids are acting up, you know, jumping on furniture, throwing things around, climbing up on top of things and so forth. And these, these young teachers who were inexperienced were stressed and were shouting at them and getting red in the face and, and just totally ineffective. And Fred was really distressed by this, and, and uh, he was going to leave because he just was so so distressed at what he saw. But then he said, okay, I'll stay the afternoon. And he saw the same exact classes, these two classes of highly misbehaving kids sitting, coming and sitting down with a couple of veteran teachers, uh, getting out their pencils, taking notes, uh, you know, raising their hands to go to the bathroom and just behaving like normal people. And he couldn't believe the difference, and he couldn't understand what it was these veteran teachers were doing because he didn't see them doing anything different from the teachers in the morning. There were no visible discipline moves. There were no threats. There were no consequences, anything like that. So he's really challenged and mystified. So he catches a couple of these teachers, the veterans in the parking lot afterward, and said, you know, I was really impressed by how you handle these kids who seem, you know, pretty poorly behaved in the morning with different teachers. What do you do? And these people kind of looked at him a little puzzled and said, well, you know, we, we mean business. And he said, well, yeah, but well, what, what do you mean by that? How, how do you mean business? And he said, well, you know, we have high expectations. And again, it was no help. So really one insight from this to Fred was interviewing people who he calls the naturals, people who really are just very natural at this, is no help at all. Because often they're not self-aware about what it is that they do or what they did, more importantly, what they did. <clears throat> and so he took the challenge of just observing hundreds of hours of, of naturals and highly effective teachers at work to try to deconstruct what exactly it was that they were doing. 
Uh, here's Fred's book. Uh, it's a large paperback format. It's kind of formatted after uh, the, the Harry Wong book, uh, First Days of School. And this is actually a combination of two previous books that he wrote. His first book was Positive Classroom Discipline. He realized at one point that wasn't enough. You have to teach well too. So he wrote a second book, Positive Classroom Instruction, and then he combined the two into this with cartoons by one of his children. And you'll see a couple of them there on the cover. So, so he took years looking at these teachers, trying to figure out what it was that they seemed to do rather effortlessly. And um, the main thing he concluded was it's not just that they're naturals. <clears throat> you know, some people are, but you can actually deconstruct what it is that those people do and train less skilled people like myself to do these things. And so he wrote these books <clears throat> and there's a nice scene. I don't know if you've seen the movie Man on Fire. It's a Denzel Washington, um, Dakota Fanning movie a number of years ago about a sort of a girl swimming, uh, going through swimming competition, among other things in, in, in uh, Mexico City. And at one point, uh, the girl does a, a time trial <clears throat> with her coach, you know, timing her. She does really well. And uh, she, you know, he tells her the time. She exults. She says, I'm tough. And her coach corrects her. There's no such thing as tough. There's trained and there's untrained. Now, which are you? So it's kind of a difference between a, 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 a fixed mindset. I'm tough and a trained. And the, and the key difference is that if you think you're tough and you lose a race, then you think you're a wimp. But if you're trained and you lose a race, then you persist and you actually get better through through hard work and practice and so forth. So that's what, what Fred tried to do was to deconstruct it. He began training, he wrote books, he wrote articles and uh, he retired and now one of his sons, Patrick Jones is, is doing the training and it is available around the country. So just to get to what, what Fred Jones is trying to do here, he's saying classroom discipline should be as cheap as possible, meaning it should be with minimum stress and aggravation. It should be with a minimum investment of time and energy so you can focus your time, your energy and time on teaching and minimal personal time outside. And I should also add minimal uh, actual dollar expense, you know, buying rewards and you know, stickers and all kinds of other stuff. His other key point is that 95% of discipline should be handled in the classroom by the teacher, not by the reinforcements called in from the office, the administrators. And if you can do that and then know when the 5% of things that really do need the office uh, need to be called, uh, then, then schools function much more cheaply because uh, not much more cheaply, much more smoothly. Right now, the case is that assistant principals, especially in principals and deans, are spending a tremendous amount of time, what a friend of mine calls wrangling students rather than you know, doing the kind of things that really add to student achievement. So that's that's the goal. 95% of this has been handled in the classroom by the teacher. So here's the overview of what we'll roll through again this in this very brief overview of what is usually a three-day training. So first of all, there's just prevention. How do you prevent things from happening in the first place? Classroom layout, classroom rules, routines, personal relationship building, and what he calls working the crowd. We'll get to that in a minute. Then there's something that he calls limit setting, which is basically the look. Okay, we'll get to that in a moment. Then there's an incentive system, a diabolically clever incentive system that he calls preferred activity time, PAT, where you milk positive experiences. And then there's that 5%, the backup system where you really are gonna need to have uh, reinforcements from, from a disciplinary or from outside, which hopefully is, is very rare. So let's ro roll off. And again, please interrupt at any point with Doug via email or text message uh, if you have a question and want to stop me and get more detail on something. Because again, this is a very quick overview of, of a much more extensive thing. <clears throat> so prevention. Uh, so just just very at, at, at the start. Um, were the schools that Fred studied including uh, urban and suburban and rural schools? Uh, well, the initial school was a tough urban school, actually a juvie hall school, but his training pertains to any kind of school. So private schools, okay. public schools, suburban, urban, and so forth. Yeah, and secondly, you might want to switch off your webcam because the sound is is a little. Uh, webcam. Okay, so where do I switch that off? Webcam. Uh, this little arrow here. That one. Is that That's it? perfect. Thank you. Yep. Oh, great. Okay, great. Okay, so let's let's continue. And so, so the first thing is how to prevent problems in the first place. <clears throat> and the rookie mistake that I made as a new sixth grade teacher in Boston in my first few years was 
starting instruction right off the bat. You know, I'll mention a few rules and start instruction. Uh, really blowing the honeymoon because the kids seemed well behaved. They're you know dressed in their best clothes. They still wanted to start off in our Boston sixth grade classroom, but but it was a huge mistake because I and I paid for that mistake for the rest of the year <clears throat> because I didn't use that time to establish routines. Cute. Amazingly enough, there are many many cartoons in my classroom management classroom discipline. Uh, so classroom layout. Custodian is the person who dictates the, the arrangement of a classroom. Here's the custodian's arrangement. Okay. So the teacher, this is not very advantageous because if you're the teacher helping a student in that back right-hand corner there, uh, excuse me, in the top left-hand corner, you're helping that student and it's the two students furthest away from you in the bottom right-hand corner are misbehaving or talking where they're, where they're not supposed to, uh, then you have a long commute to get to them. Uh, so is to have what he calls an interior loop that a teacher can take to establish proximity with as many students as possible, basically every student in the classroom. So strategically, this makes a huge amount of sense. The assumption here is that the closer you are to students, the less likely they are to misbehave. The further away you are from students, the more likely they are to misbehave. See, so it's sort of a green and a red zone uh, emanating from you. So of course, Um, so the second like this and just immediately rearrange the classrooms. So if they run upstairs and change, change the classroom arrangement because, and maybe the custodian might not be that happy with it, but that, that makes a huge difference to their management. So the second thing is class, and uh, here's a cute cartoon about a, a teacher here, and perhaps they're a little on the negative side. And uh, um, Fred Jones recommends you know, what's a good classroom? What's a good teacher? What's a good student? Getting, pulling out of the kids a few list of rules, a small list of rules that are on the, on the positive side. Uh, when I was principal at the Mather School in Boston, we spent quite a lot of time doing this, and we came up with what we called the five commandments, all of which were you know, positive things. You know, come to school on time, come to school prepared. You know, you know, etc. So uh, there's enough advice on as a principal is to, to establish routines around simple things like sharpening pencils, going to the bathroom, getting help, uh, helping your peers and so forth. And, and he really says, you've got to spend a couple of weeks at the beginning of the year training these to mastery. So if we're going to the library, we're, we're walking down the hall, stop. <clears throat> you know, that wasn't quite right. Go back, do it again. You know, really being quite dogged about this. And sure, kids are frustrated by this, but they get the idea of what, how they handle sort of basic things. And he says rightly, and, and, and by the way, good teachers have known this uh, for more than a thousand years, but naive people like me and many other beginning teachers and even some veteran teachers just don't do this. And simply spending the time at the beginning of the year to train routines to mastery um, is, is, is time very well spent you, you, you rest of the year. Uh, there's also school-wide routines, and this is more in the principal's bailiwick. How do we come in in the morning? How do we move around the building? Cafeteria and recess time, bathroom procedures, bus and walker dismissal, all trained to, to mastery in the opening days. The fourth one, of course, is, is personal relationships. Uh, it's a simple thing of having name tags on opening day. Uh, my daughter is a seventh grade teacher in Boston. She, at the beginning of the year, does an exercise where everyone learns everyone else's names. And she's got you know 150 students, and she knows those names within a couple of days. And the kids know them too, which changes the whole atmosphere in the classroom. It's not, hey, you. It's, it's Jose, I want to talk to you about this. Uh, good icebreaker activities, of course, class meetings, reaching out to students and their families. There's some very good software, the, um, the Panorama platform, uh, panoramaed.org. Uh, has a beginning of the year uh, software program where every kid can say a few things they're interested in and the teacher says things they're interested in and you by matching up teachers interests and student interests whether it's the Yankees or whether it's chess or whatever it is drag racing uh, it has a, a measurable effect on student relationships trust and and actually instruction and, and learning during the course of the year um, 
The other thing is just a simple thing of a weekly administrative team meeting, focus on who, who teachers and administrators are worried about and focusing and coming up with a plan of action. Another thing that isn't in my notes here, but which, which uh, I have in mind through a recent article I read is this business of a school identifying the students who nobody knows. And one device for doing this is putting all the names up on, on, a, on a board and having people put posted no, uh, dots uh, on, by the kids that they know beyond regular classroom uh, sort of uh, routines and, and uh, noticing the kids. And every time this is done, they notice the kids who nobody knows, who nobody has a relationship with, nobody knows anything about, and then setting up a protocol to make sure that every student is known well by at least one adult in the school. And then, of course, the student support team, different schools have different names for this, you know, regular conferences on students who are at risk. So establishing relationships, uh, really getting getting the affect of the side. <clears throat> I like that one. Is that your real hair color? Another do tend to play favorites. We all have that sense of the kids who maybe were like us and who remind us of us as kids. And uh, that's got to be guarded against too. This cartoon does rather well with that, which is simply walking around the room, establishing that proximity, uh, just in noticing things and looking over kids' shoulders and chatting to kids and so forth. And there's an expression for this breaking the pain. It's as if there's a, an invisible pane of glass at the front of the room, and, and, and some teachers never break that pane, never get out into the room. This is a picture of a different teacher moving around, getting close to all the kids, uh, bringing that sort of green, uh, red light of misbehavior and green light of relationships to the kids all around the room. He calls this sort of an interior loop. So this is just working the crowd, getting out, out and about. I was in a workshop yesterday in uh, New York City where the leader of it uh, was constantly moving around the room, just getting behind people, in front of people, through things and so forth. And it made a big difference to the feel of the workshop. This is all adults, but just to, to her getting around and establishing her, her proximity all around the room. And the sixth is explain good teaching. Uh, of course, there's a huge amount to that. Many books have been written about this. Uh, and, and some of it is just as, as simple as being really clear <laughs> so the kids are not confused. So here's a, a piece. This is posted on the wall. And this shows every single step of a long division problem, the traditional way of doing long division, you know, divide, multiply, subtract, bring down, and so forth. But by having it all up there at once as a poster, a so-called worked problem provides that kind of clarity. It's, of course, a scaffolding that helps kids to, uh, you know, to, um, to get it <clears throat> and eventually to become independent in this. So, so if you do these five things, <clears throat> you prevent a large number of discipline problems. Just simple routines, simple clarity, you know, simple relationship building and so forth. And putting in, especially putting in the time at the beginning of the year to do that, committing the time up front to the, to the detriment perhaps of getting started with the curriculum makes an enormous difference. And again, I have to confess, this is one of my weaknesses as a beginning teacher. I just didn't do these things systematically. I hadn't read Fred Jones because he hadn't written the book at that point, And that made an enormous difference to me. Okay, questions, please chime in. Um, otherwise, we'll move ahead. Uh, the second major category in Fred Jones is, is what he calls limit setting. And he actually says that the kids who test us, who actually test our, our limits uh, right at the beginning, who, to, who push back, who begin to misbehave, are actually doing the teacher an enormous favor because the rest of the class is watching to see do you mean business? Do you really mean what you said at the beginning about those rules that are important to instruction? or do you really not mean them? And so he says, how you deal with this initial testing behavior by kids is tremendously important. And the funny thing is, the research shows that, that most big discipline problems begin with small things. Things that drive simple things, like kids talking when they're not supposed to be talking, kids uh, out of their seat without permission, just little things. This is not, you know, this is not code red. This is not a major deal. Nothing threatening going on here, but it really aggravates and stresses teachers out. But many teachers respond to this the wrong way. They nag, they threaten, and ultimately they punish. <clears throat> and that cycle of nag, threaten, punish 
uh, creates a negative dynamic and is actually ineffective at dealing with these small behaviors, which then begin to escalate into major behaviors. So again, this is, I'm sick and tired of class. When I look up, I expect to see these. These sound like familiar teacher phrases, and the stress is is rising up. So a typical small discipline problem close to the beginning of the year. The teacher is helping a student, <clears throat> leaning over, explaining something to a student, and notices out of the corner of her eye that a couple of students across the room are, are goofing off or not doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is that this is a silent worker, so they're supposed to be working. So the rookie mistake is, is to ignore the problem. Okay, we're going to extinguish this. So you say it'll, it'll go away. And of course, what do the students do? They continue to goof off to talk whatever it is they're doing, you know, teasing or whatever it is they're doing. What is the message that the rest of the class gets? It's that you actually don't mean business. You don't mean what you said you were going to do at the beginning of the year. And so everyone gets the wrong message at this point and so uh, then you okay so now you do interview you reprimand them across the across the room and what you get is what fred jones calls smiley face <laughs> pseudo compliance okay and and then it continues the behavior continues of course and then the teacher's angry i'm sick and tired of this he calls it sn snap and snarl threatening the kids you're gonna stay after school you'll be in detention whatever it is and finally laying down the law and building out the punishment and then in the teacher's room afterward the teacher's saying you know i didn't go into teaching to become a police officer so all this can be avoided <clears throat> uh, Fred is, is a psychologist, and uh, he's actually studied the brain research on this. And, and what happens when someone goes through this kind of stress, see his minor, but the, it's stressful when kids don't obey you, is your, your eyes open wide, a quick inhalation of breath, your teeth clench, your muscles tense. There's what is called vasoconstriction, blood in the large, the blood goes to the large muscles. This is the fight or flight kind of thing. Adrenaline pumps into the blood, and it actually takes a person about 27 minutes to get out of that <clears throat> sort of fight flight reflex to get out of that 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 mindset which is really actually unhealthy and so looking at downshifting from the neocortex okay <laughs> where we do our better thinking right down through the doggy horsey brain the paleocortex down to the reptilian brain the lizard brain the basic survival instincts this is this is not healthy and again we don't do our best thinking when we're stressed and when we're angry so hence a lot of the mistakes the teachers made. Maybe the teacher go totally ballistic before us is this little imp on the way to the principal's office. Teachers are doing this a lot. When they're getting into this rut of, of stress and nagging and threatening and punishing, it's exhausting. They're resentful. They begin to feel like it's us against uh, up, us against uh, them. Uh, they're rationalizing about bad groups, bad homes, and so forth. Uh, they're feeling futile. Doesn't get better. They become cynical and they also become unhealthy. Uh, this is this this kind of stress is very debilitating on teachers. So what's the author uh, has analyzed what he calls limit setting, what I will call the look. And and you may have had a parent or a teacher or a grandmother in your past who was really a proficient at doing this. Uh, but it turns out there's a lot to it. <clears throat> he Fred talks about Queen Victoria sort of looking at somebody basically saying, We are not amused. But it's all body language. And so he's deconstructed this. He's noticed that baseball umpires are actually trained explicitly in how to handle an angry manager who's kicking sand on their feet and yelling and screaming and swearing at them. Uh, I noticed the, the umpire here, I, you know, he totally, totally keeping his cool uh, you know, in this. So he, he's deconstructed the the look so and, and his, his time is power upset is weakness if you can't control a classroom you can't until you first control yourself if you get angry the other person's in control if you remain calm you are in control but it, it does take some training and practice i actually went to i forgot to mention went to a three-day fred jones workshop in in uh, cincinnati years ago and uh, we a whole uh, cafeteria 150 people practiced this for a little while uh, you know, and, and it is it is possible to learn this even if it doesn't come naturally to it. Another piece of good news. So he, here's here's how the setting. So you're helping this kid. You notice this mis mis misbehavior on the other side of the room. Um, you excuse yourself from the student. You take two relaxing breaths. You clear your mind. You turn slowly your head and shoulders and body. And this is a very important thing: is orienting your entire body, including your feet, toward the people that that you're that you're going to be looking at. You're pointing your toes, which shows total body commitment. 
you re actually relax your face and your jaw. I remember we sort of practiced this, you know, breathing, take two, two breaths. There's no expression on your face. There's no, it's not a scowl. It's a misconception about the look. You relax your hands. You've actually thought through uh, where are your hands best, in front of you, behind you, at your side. You, you look in a mirror and you figure out what's the most comfortable space. And you look straight at these people, particularly one of them, right, right here at the, at the person across the room. And you just look, you don't glare, you just, your, your body is relaxed, your face is relaxed, and you look at these people. And you see flat affect, again, it's not a glare. Uh, you use relaxation techniques like breathing, but not uh, just, just a, a calm breath or what he calls a relaxing breath. You stay in your neocortex and you are totally committed to the problem. That the message here is, is all the time in the world. And, and the baseball umpires who do this, they own that diamond. Of course, the, the players and the umpire and the, the, uh, the manager know that, that they can be ejected at any point, which kids playing that card at this point. And kids will try to get off the hook. <clears throat> uh, they'll blame it on somebody else. It wasn't me. Uh, they'll, they'll give smiley thoughts. They'll give some back talk uh, and so forth. And, or they'll just you know, push you aside or put you know, verbally uh, uh, or, or, or body language push you aside. Sometimes there's even nasty back talk about the teacher's dress or grooming or bad breath or something like that. And the trick, Fred Jones says, is to ignore all that because the back talk, it takes two fools to make a conversation out of it. So you don't get into that, <clears throat> and not of this, who did it, and so forth. Open your mouth, mouth and slit your throat, says Fred. So you keep the look. And the astonishing thing about this is that about 85% of the time it works. It stops the misbehavior. You hold the look until they are back at work doing what they're supposed to be doing. And notice that you don't go public. You don't call the kid's name. You don't call them out in front of their peers. It's just a look, but everyone else notices what's going on. And it has a real impact on the rest of the class. You mean business, but very quietly in a, in a, in a kind of quasi-respectful way, but you're calling these kids out without saying a word. So this simple technique that he calls limit setting is extremely effective at dealing with a lot of low-level stuff. Now, there's several other steps of this that are in the book and that are in this training that I won't go into, stage two, stage three. But most of the time, the kids will fold after this initial across-the-room look. Pretty darn effective. Go straight to nag, threaten, punish, and so forth. It's a big mistake. It puts a lot of stress on them. A lot of the time, this goofing off, I, I said 85%, it's 80% in the book, of one one can be handled by the lemon setting. Okay, so that, and again, this can be trained. It can be learned. Uh, it's the kind of thing you work with with a colleague, you practice in front of a mirror. Uh, it takes a little bit of, a little bit of training but it's not an impossible thing to, for anyone to learn. And it, it's part of this, of course, is method acting. Okay, any questions at this point, do chime in. How are we doing, Doug? Do, doing great, thanks very much. Okay, so the third thing is, is a group incentive system. And again, these things are pretty unique to Fred Jones. I've looked at a lot of classroom management uh, stuff and I really haven't seen these handled in the same way. I don't, I don't know of anyone else that trains the look. Okay? So the third is, is, is a group incentive system. So he thinks that another 15% of misbehavior can be handled with, with a proper use of incentive. So why do we need incentives? Well, it takes thousands of acts of cooperation to keep a classroom running smoothly. Uh, kid doesn't have a pencil, uh, getting the kids in their seats, getting them to clean up at the end of a messy art period. And uh, most kids will be cooperative with this, but not all, because some kids, as he puts it, are at war with adult authority. And every time a kid doesn't cooperate, it adds to the teacher's workload and stress and slows things down, gets in the way of instruction. So here's a Fred Jones, none of whom owe anything to you before the first day of school and half of whom have been blatantly mismanaged since the day they were born. Now ask yourself, are you going to get all the cooperation you need from all the students all year long just because you love them and care for them and are willing to go the extra mile? Will relationship alone be enough? Are you kidding? So you get a little bit of Fred Jones's sardonic uh, humor with this, and uh, it sounds a, a little negative, but I think he's he's got something there. Okay? You cannot count on cooperation from everybody. So the alternative of laying down the law, <clears throat> barking at kids and so forth, punishing them and so forth, you, you can't police all those acts of compliance. You, you need incentives, <clears throat> but used properly. 
And many, many teachers give free time, show movies, have pizza parties and stuff. But do they get everything out of them that they could? And the answer to that is no. Certainly in my case as a teacher, no. And so he cites grandma's rule. You must do good things to get good things. You have to eat your spinach to get your dessert, basically. And so, but the three keep it cheap. Now, Fred is a psychologist, certainly knows about behavior modification, was trained in it, did a lot of it himself. But he has concluded that for a classroom teacher with 25, 30 kids, it's too expensive to do behavior modification, to keep track of it, to give the rewards. He thinks the only classroom incentive system that is doable is a group reward system, all for one and one for all. And here's how his work. Probably a quick card. The teacher gives a gift of a certain amount of PAT time at the beginning of the week. So let's just take first, for, for example, let's say the beginning of the week, the class is given 15 minutes in Friday afternoon. This is going to be fun learning time. And they go through a negotiation uh, to find out what that's going to be. So the kids have to really want to do it. It has to be really fun. And the teacher has to believe that it will have learning benefits to the curriculum <clears throat> and to skill building and knowledge building and so forth. So it has to be something like math, baseball, or social studies, history, um, uh, Jeopardy, or some form. And this is, we're not talking about playing ch checkers here. We're talking about a substantive and yet fun learning activity. And he's, his website has a whole bunch of these suggested PAT activities for different uh, different parts of the curriculum, different grade levels. And so you agree in that. Okay, so here's our 15 minutes of PAT time at the beginning of the week, and we have this to look forward to on Friday afternoon. So then during the week, you can add to their group PAT time by doing things like everyone bringing in their homework. Okay, that's five extra minutes. Uh, cleaning up the class more quickly at the end by the bell ring, by the time the bell rings. <clears throat> Getting a pencil to a kid who needs a pencil and so forth, all these. So what that creates, because the whole class is being rewarded, what that creates is an incentive to get everyone to cooperate. And the teacher is then simply standing back, being the impartial kind of arbiter of this. So I gave, gave you two minutes to clean up, two minutes to clean up. Okay, kids are then urgently whispering to one another. They're not they, they, without the teacher having to nag. So they basically you've delegated to the kids the nagging. <laughs> they do it themselves. So that's the additions to the subtraction from PAT is that say a child doesn't have a pencil, is not ready, is not in their seat, and so forth. At that point, the clock starts running, and he actually recommends a noisy stopwatch. Tick, tick, tick. These are seconds that are being deducted from the whole class's PAT time at the end of the week. And you keep track up on the board or someplace or on a computer app. What happens at that point? The teacher is the calm, impartial timekeeper. Other kids are giving a pencil to that kid who doesn't have a pencil or urging that kid to do whatever needs to be done. So you can see that this whole system is rigged. Uh, you're adding in minutes, you're subtracting in seconds. And if things are going relatively smoothly, then by the end of the week, you have half an hour of PAT time. Terrific. Everybody enjoys it. Next week starts off with that kind of thing. So this is a very clever and extremely effective way of, of getting cooperation and actually creating fun learning stuff, which is, again, it has to be substantive. It can't be. We're not, we're not playing checkers. So you can get out of the the pencil bit. People hearing about PAT say three things. First of all, it's bribery. You're bribing the kids. Well, no, it's not really bribery. It's an incentive system. You're not giving a kid 50 cents for cleaning up their room. You're creating a group incentive to cooperate and do the right thing. Second concern is that it wastes valuable instructional time. Well, no, if the PAT time is substantive and fun. And again, there's a whole stock of stuff uh, that teachers have contributed over the years that are really, that really enhance the curriculum. So this is time well spent. And the third concern is, won't it open the door to a, a real uh, nasty student uh, bringing the rest of the class down, refusing to cooperate? Uh, and, and Fred says this is relatively rare. Most kids get with the program. But for those students who are trying to bring everyone else down, he does have another intervention. It's called a mission training. And I won't, I won't go into it. We don't have time for it this afternoon. But it is an incredibly effective method of dealing with those kids. So again, this is a chapter in the book. It's called a mission training. Uh, they can deal with those relatively rare incidents. Okay, so about PAT time, about productivity time. You've got to build the foundation. 
You have to have the effective classroom layout. You have to have the routines established. You have to work the crowd. You have to be limit setting and you have to teach well. All those things are the foundation. People, some people hear about PAT and they start implementing it right away and it doesn't work because they haven't built the foundation. So Fred Jones, when he did, when he used to do quick uh, you know, intro things like this, he, he didn't even talk about PAT because he, he was so worried that people would jump into it. So, but I'm, I'm talking about it because I think it's very, it's, it's part of the pro program. But again, you have to build those foundations. <clears throat> and, and the other thing is you don't do PAT in anger. You don't say, okay, well, it settles it. No PAT time for the class this week, you know, because the teacher got angry and said, you can't do that. It's, it's a real bargain. It's a, again, it's a negotiation between the subtraction and the addition, but it is rigged in a positive direction. So how often you should be doing PAT time. Uh, he says with kindergarten, you're doing it every hour. So very frequently. With grade one, about three times a day. With grade two to five, about twice a day. With middle school, twice a week. And with high school, once a week. So the example I gave at the Friday PAT, that would be at a high school level. Again, go to the website, fredjones.com, if you want to see lots of examples of PAT time. Okay. So the fourth, this is when all else has failed. If things are going well, this is only 5% or sometimes even zero. I mean, I know teachers who never sent kids to the office, who, who virtually never had discipline problems in their classrooms because they were so effective at doing all these other things. But for the, when you do need the backup system, what you're talking about here is a systematic hierarchy of negative sanctions that make it futile for a student to continue misbehaving. So the three levels, actually four levels, sorry. There's the small backup system, which he calls a word to the wise. And I'll never forget uh, in this big cafeteria uh, in the Midwest where I was at this workshop, three day workshop with 150 people, Fred said, okay, watch what I do here. And he, so he walks around and he leans over and he talks very quietly to one person. And he leans over and talks very quietly to another person. Then he leans over and talks very quietly and then he comes back to the front. And he said, okay, in which of those situations did I lay down the law? And we, we didn't know, it was private. Uh, and only, and when he asked, called on those three people. One of the person, people said, Fred whispered in my ear, I've been noticing what you're doing. And if this continues, there's going to be a very serious consequence. Okay, so that's a, a word to the wise, okay? Very effective. A medium backup is, is more traditional things like a timeout area, a, a think area, including with a neighboring teacher who has who's set up to take students from the room next door as part of an agreement you know where you can go and, and chill out and get yourself together uh, those are can be used effectively and then there's the large backup more serious things uh, calling the office in and this is where restorative justice comes in this very effective new whole new thing on on, on how do you get the people the, the the aggrieved and and the offending people together in a structured environment and and really uh, solve the problem without hopefully without punishments. Um, and then the very large is, we're talking about expulsion here, we're talking about the criminal justice system. So these are the layers of the backup system. Uh, here's the small is private, uh, the medium is public within the classroom, and the large requires the involvement of, of, of two professionals for getting someone else in there. Uh, so, in, in some teachers to, to just, when they get angry, to call the office. Uh, and it's usually a small number of people. Fred calls them the office junkies. Uh, the problem is that being sent to the office is often not a punishment because the office is kind of an interesting place. You know, people come and go, there's stuff going on, you know, people flirt with each other, stuff is going on. And, and, and also one of the big complaints that many teachers have is I sent the kid to the office and 20 minutes later, they, they brought them back to the classroom. It's supposedly cured, but not really cured. Uh, apparently, in an average high school, Fred Jones cites research, there's, there are often 3,000 office referrals in the course uh, of an average year. And again, the teachers are angry because the kids aren't fixed when they come back. Uh, so the question is, and administrators need to set limits. Uh, uh, because when you call the office, you're basically saying to the child, I can't handle you, I need someone else. It's like saying when dad gets home. Uh, so, so really, you got to call the office only for suspendable offenses. Um, and also, in our school, uh, we just we said don't don't send a kid to the office. That's irrational. You're sending a misbehaving student unescorted through the halls of this school. No, you call for assistance. You know. You, and so we developed over the years. Uh, it took us a while to figure this out. A list of things that you must call the office for. They were basically suspendable offenses. Uh, so let's consider the family stop. Perhaps we can all pay attention to what I'm doing here. So the bubble pops. Uh, do we call the office for this one? Probably not. You need to make that clear. 
here's a a slightly different situation. You might agree that this was an, an office referral situation. It's a moment to look it over. Again, on the left of the things that the teacher needs to handle in the classroom, on the right of the things that they really need to call the office for. So just, just kind of skim over this list and, and see what's on both sides. Notice uh, PDA, uh, public displays of affection, is, is on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side toward the bottom is repeated PDA. <laughs> so you have variations like that. So I, I would submit that every school needs a list like this. And uh, you might even take theirs <clears throat> as a model and then and alter it to your situation. It needs to be clear at the beginning of the year explicitly what things teachers need to manage in their classrooms. And if they need training and support and how to do that, they should need to get that. And then there are things that are just, it, it's just non-negotiable. You know, if there's a threat, if there's a sexual harassment going on, if there's a security threat, if there are lewd notes being passed, uh, there's a dress code violation, whatever it is, you got a dress code, uh, or making a, a thing, you need to call the office, you need to get the office involved. And, and that division of labor there cuts way down. I mean, I had situations where a student would, a teacher would send a kid to the office for not doing their homework three days in a row, or for sucking their teeth and, and, and rolling their eyes at me, stuff like that. You need to, you need to, uh, to establish that at the beginning of the year. And I think Centennial has done a great job here. Uh, but again, it, it would be altered in an elementary school in different places. This is because uh, of course, schools, right? So there are limitations to the backup system. It is the most what he calls expensive and failure prone kind of discipline. Uh, punishments seem to work best for the kids who need them least, the well-behaved kids. Uh, they're, they're the ones who are going to be really cowed by this and, and approved. Hardcore kids, it, it may not work at all. And there's a small number of, quote, bad kids, about 5% in schools, uh, who get 95% of the punishment. So what's wrong with this, this picture here? It's not fixing them. Uh, they tend to be recidivists. They tend to be, again, what, what schools call fre frequent flyers. So a good discipline procedure should self-eliminate. It should work. It should actually change things. Um, but there are times when, obviously, we have to use the backup system. So here's Fred's ladder here. You'll see you start off with a relationship building and the limit setting is on the, on the suppression side. Then on the reinforcement side, a simple incentive system, the PAT. On the right, a complex incentive system like responsibility training. And on the left, a mission training. <clears throat> on the right, a small backup response system. On the left, a mission training for the group. On the right, medium backup response system, re-examining management methods. <clears throat> and then on the right, a large backup system. So this sort of is the escalation between the positive on, on the left and the negative on the right. So let's walk through the Fred Jones approach to classroom management. I would love to entertain any questions or comments that people have. Go ahead. Kim, we do have a couple of questions. First of all, back to the look. Uh, what's the proximity uh, between the teacher and the student uh, during uh, the look? <clears throat> okay, so it starts off across the room, uh, but again, looking right at the the, the most uh, uh, important miscreant right between the eyes, so across the room. And again, Fred says that 80% of the time that works. If you hold the look, if you commit your body to the person, if you just look and, and handle it well, which is, is trainable, uh, usually the behavior will stop at that point. And he says you're strategic. You look, you look at the legs underneath the table. Did the legs separate out? Are, are they really back to work and not just putting on an act for you and holding that look. He then, if that doesn't work, and again, now we're talking about a small percentage of the time, he, he recommends walking slowly across the room, uh, holding the look toward the people. And, and, and usually at that point they fold. But again, for an even smaller percentage of the time, getting pretty close and continuing to look. But again, no comment, no, no words, uh, you know, you might call a name, but, but no, I mean, just say, you know, George. <clears throat> Um, but but no reprimand. And then the ultimate of this is going, what he calls going to, to, to elbows, <clears throat> putting your elbow on the desk and being very close, and then ultimately palms. And so, so but, but again, those are rare situations where that's needed to get that close. Thank you. Uh, next, um, you've mentioned several different lengths of seminars. When you do these presentations, how many staff days do they take? 
So mine again is a short version of the, of the full Fred Jones. The full Fred Jones is two or three days done by Patrick Jones, his son. And I guess they have other people to do it too. Um, again, the website would be a contact for that. Mine is this short version. I'm not a, I'm not fully, uh, you know, I, I don't do the, the full two day training. I, I suppose I could, but I'm not really in that role. It's a similar role that I have with Jay McTie on the understanding by design. I, I'm the go-to person for the short version of that. Um, thank you. Uh, I would just add one more research note to this. Uh, at Creative Leadership Solutions, every time, bar none, we have studied reductions in student failures, uh, we've also seen improvements in behavior. Hmm. And one of the most important ways to to get uh, to get a school suspensions down and garden variety misbehavior down is to reduce the DF rate. There are really specific ways that in other webinars we've talked about that can make immediate and profound impacts in reducing the DEF rate. So I would look at that as a real strategy to, to improve discipline in your school. Uh, the second thing that I might uh, add before we adjourn is uh, one thing I've asked some schools to do is before the ends and they've got all these office referral records, take a look at about 100 randomly selected office referrals and ask what were they for? Because the some people might say, well, they're all for you know, violent felons. And in fact, you'll find that 90% of them are for things like disrespect or eye rolling and that sort of thing that, as Kim said, should be in the classroom. And it will give you at your school a very local data-based way to say what is the real source of office referrals. And it'll be a really persuasive way to help people understand that we can manage this better. I just, Kim, just, I want to thank you so much. I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Time for one quick comment. Of course. I think my naive assumption at the beginning of my teaching was that good teaching is enough, <clears throat> that if you just teach well, that'll take care of everything. Uh, that is the naive assumption because you've got kids, again, who are at war with adult authority, who have other issues going on, and they, you, know, you need a whole structure to deal with them and to make the thing run smoothly. But back to the naive assumption, good teaching really is important. And also, as you were alluding to, uh, also a, 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 a different way of structuring grades and to cut down the number of Ds and Fs, both through good teaching and also through effective use of grades. So those two things are really, really important. And again, if the administrator's time is freed up from all this nonsense that they shouldn't be dealing with, that teachers should be dealing with in their classrooms, then administrators can com commit themselves more to the effective supervision and coaching of teachers to continuously improve teaching and also to orchestrate those teacher team meetings where some of the best work goes on of teachers sharing effective practices with each other. Exactly. Well, Kim, thank you so much for your time today. Thank our audience for your kind attention. Uh, we'll have this webinar available as a free download at creativeleadership.net. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.